Hi, I'm Nick Elvester. I'm the general manager of primary storage at Quantum. And today we're going to go through a, a brief demonstration of our Myriad product. And I wanted to start out with the, the dashboard. So immediately upon logging in, you get into the dashboard and it gives you some basic information to tell you about the health of the system and, and a generalized overview. So first of all, we show the effective capacity. In this case, we're running some workload. And in that workload, we're getting, you know, a reasonable amount of data reduction, almost three to one. And it shows how many, uh, how many terabytes are being used up for files, how many are used for erasure coding, uh, a brief system summary and with, with health information, like, you know, a health heart to just tell you that everything's looking okay. So the system we'll be demonstrating is a five node system. So we show each node their health and then a at a glance view of your file systems. Myriad is a multi-file system product, so you can have one file system and put everything in there and have shares underneath it, or you can have multiple file systems, uh, for example, to divide them up between different departments or different use cases, and I'll show you how the division of file systems can give you some more insight into your workload. Uh, but here's a summary of everything that we're doing. And then at the bottom of the page, we have some performance charts that aggregate the performance for everything that's happening on the cluster. In this case, we're running some uh, a workload with uh, NFS clients. We have both NFS uh, 4 and NFS 3 clients running at the same time on this cluster. And you can see from the charting, and we're doing something around 22 gigabytes a second writes and uh, 15 gigabytes a second read. So we have a bit of a mixed workload here running. One of the things you were showing in the beginning is that you have GPU direct support. I'm seeing here NFS v4. So uh, am I assuming here that you're providing N N uh, NFS v4 over RDMA access or uh, uh, something like that, or PNFS? In, the, in the, the workload that we're doing right now is just NFS v4 TCP. Okay. Um, we don't have NFS v4 over RDMA today, but that is uh, on our roadmap. OK, thank you. Um, so in addition to, you know, throughput, we show IOPS. So, so, you know, pretty obvious things here are, are IOPS that we're running. Uh, and, and we can zoom in on the different areas of the chart if we want to look at a smaller granular piece of data. And we have latency heat maps that we can use to see where the latency is coming in for the workload. There's both write and read latency heat maps that show, you know, these are where most of the IOPS are happening. And then we have storage usage charts. And the storage usage chart showing on a per file system basis what capacity is being used. And one of the nice things about these charts is we have a file system here called perf one logical. So the there's logical and then compressed data. So I can look at the specific file system and I can see over time how many terabytes I'm putting into that file system in the form of files and then how much that particular file system is getting compressed as as the data goes into it. So we can show that information on the file system by file system basis, which means, for example, if you had a file system that you're using for image data or video data, which generally isn't very compressible in a file system that you wanted to have for um, backup, for example, you could see the higher compression ratio that you're going to end up with in a backup use case versus a generalized uh, video and image use case. So then in in the file systems tab, this is where we manage the file systems and we have a lot of flexibility. Um, when Ben was talking about the architecture, he was talking about the redirect on write nature of the file system, which gives us a lot of flexibility in how we can compose these file systems and be able to to use them. So. I have two file systems, perf1 and perf2. You can clearly perf2 is not being heavily used. If I go into perf1, I just I have a share. So this is where all the clients are writing into right now. Um, and we can make snapshots of it very easily. So, you know, that's pretty standard fare. Um, just press the button. I'll create a snapshot with a default value, which will give us a snapshot that's based on the date. And one of the things that we can do because of the multi-file system nature of this is then we can take one of these snapshots and we can easily create a clone of that. Uh, and I'll just take the default name for this clone. 
but this allows me to take a clone at a point in time of that file system. And when we make a clone versus a snapshot, the clone's a read-write version of the file system and the state that it was at during that snapshot. And it's created as a new file system. And so now my clone shows up in the file systems page. And what it allows me to do, first of all, is that in this clone, it's it's a file system. So you can see it's got the attributes. Of course, it really uses no incremental storage space to take this clone. It's all deduplicated. And the only additional incremental space is the delta between the original snapshot and the state of the clone. But now this is a separate independent file system and it contains no shares. So effectively, it's a hidden version of that file system. And then if I want to do a read write on it, all I have to do is create a share and it can be an arbitrary share name and type. And then I can attach clients to it and it'll let me go operate on the data as it was at the, at the time I took the clone. So there's flexibility there. Now let's say this was a test clone. When I created the clone, it was the size that, that uh, it, it, it was when I took that snapshot, so the file system. But the file systems are elastic. They're thinly provisioned on the file on the uh, key value store. So when I create a file system, it doesn't allocate any space for that file system. It's It's totally thinly provisioned. And we can shrink it up and down. So in this case, I um, want to make the file system smaller because I'm just using it as a test. And if I was doing that test, I don't want them to consume any extra storage space. So I can easily just edit it and shrink it down. And now it's only 75 terabytes. The other thing that we can do then is to go into a file system and check out what it's doing. So I can go into each file system and find out what the IOPS and throughput are, um, a file system specific latency, heat map, like the one that was on the dashboard. And we also track all the operations that are occurring on the file system. So you can see a rollover here, which shows all the different attributes that the, of the operation. So in this case, it turns out actually what a lot of what we're doing is make making directories and uh, doing stats on those files. So there's a lot of write operations and, and making directories. And this can be useful for different use cases, especially with uh, smile, uh, small files. So lots of tiny files getting created and being able to see uh, how much uh, metadata operations you're able to get from that. And then, of course, we have an isolated version of the storage usage page that we had seen at the beginning, where, again, I can look over time how I'm doing on my logical versus compressed usage here. And we all we'll also track the metadata, which is usually a rounding error. Um, any questions on how the file systems work? I, I do I do have one question regarding the, the snapshots. So I wanted to ask if you currently provide immutable snapshots and as a corollary, corollary question to that, whether uh, the use case is that you plan to primarily support require any kind of immutability the the snapshots are you know they're they're read only the, the they are they are deletable at this moment we don't have a policy engine to uh i'll say place a hold on a snapshot but it but it is not changeable and then as i showed in the other portion when we create file systems if we don't put a share on it that's effectively completely hidden from anyone being able to access it. From from outside the system, yeah, I tell you, I, you're going for the same backup use case I'm thinking of, Max. Um, but just it's going slightly sideways, but on the policy side, and particularly around the admin access side. So yes, the snapshot can't be accessed outside the system. But what do you have around uh, Controlling for insider threats where a disgruntled admin goes and just nukes everybody's snapshots because they're having a bad day. <laughs> right. So, I mean, so the, we, we supported Active Directory for the administrative users. Um, and of course, Active Directory has some multi factor authentication that you can do. Um, we It isn't in the product now, but we do have on the roadmap by request from users more so than just 
multi-factor authentication for a particular admin, but multi-factor authentication for administrative actions. And, um, and more than just one administer, administrator. So for example, a file system delete would require multi-factor authentication from two different administrators in order to delete it, to prevent that disgruntled administrator use case. So you will require some sort of quorum, right? So two or three people signing off the operation before it goes through. Okay. That's right. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So we we have a shares page, so there's, you know, not much to see there, just regular listing of the shares. As you build out, if you have lots of shares, we make it searchable. Um, some customers do things like make one share per user and end up with many, many shares. Um, in the notes page, this is, this is a representation, a lot of what um, Ben had gone, th gone through in the architecture view. You can sort of see how it actually looks on the screen. There's the management switch, and you can see we have these ports on the management switch. Those connect back to the storage node, and then these links go to the customer network. Similarly with the load balancers. So some of the ports are going to the storage cluster, and then the remainder of these ports are actually uplinked with BGP peering that Ben described to the client side network. And using the ECMP, that allows the clients to distribute the load across the ports that are connected to the customer network, which gives us that built-in load balancing using one IP address, whereas a lot of the traditional mechanisms to load balance clients across a scale-out NAS cluster are typically, you know, each of, each of the ports on the cluster node have a virtual IP address and usually an external service like DNS is used to round robin or load balance and um, based on, you know, least connected, et cetera. In this case, all the load balancing is completely done through the network. And the ports that we plug into on the storage side, we automatically configure. Um, so in a certain way versus what we typically see on a scale out NAS cluster, we're sort of consolidating the front end and the back end and in, into these load balancers where you usually see a diagram of a normal scale at NAS cluster with a dedicated back end network and a dedicated front end network. And then our nodes, they're these particular nodes, they're one use servers. They have 10 NVMe devices in them. You can see we, you know, there, there's a fill level. It shows our health information. It shows operational, how big the drives are, you know, some details about them, the, the power on hours, et cetera. So from here, we would show, you know, failures, et cetera. Um, we can, you know, blink LEDs uh, if they, if the admin wants to go find that system in the rack. And then we do a broad summary of the drives. And, you know, part of, part of what we're doing here is writing a bunch of data. And an important aspect of that is that we're randomly picking this the set of drives that each erasure code sets using, which means that the usage of the drives is is very evenly spread out. And the system tries to maintain that even spread over time, even as we add or remove components. So you can see this the spread here between the most used drive is 11.73% and the least used drive is 11.69%. So as we select the zones that Ben described in the system to write the data. We're really evenly spreading that out and the selection of those drives is, is effectively random. So there's no hotspots for different pieces of data. And then one last thing to show you, um, to just give you a sense of the microservices, you know, what is running on top of Kubernetes. Uh, the microservices are broken into a bunch of namespaces that that do different functions and the flexibility of Kubernetes to give us opportunity over time to add functionality. That functionality results in being another microservices that gets deployed on the Kubernetes cluster. We provide Kubernetes the rules set to distribute that microservice across the cluster. That gives us that that scalability, but it also gives us some agility in how we can develop software and software features uh, because we don't have to replace every single element running on the system 
as a big, you know, monolithic container or virtual machine or, you know, other different kinds of process to deploy these. So we've broken our system up into quite a number of different smaller microservices. And so here's the example of, you know, node one has 30 pods running on it, a variety of different things related to the observability stack where we're getting those stats that we showed in the charts, but also the different pieces of our system that do the actual work, you know, this, this, and this node has 20 pods. So these pods are getting distributed across the cluster by Kubernetes. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of them that are spread around the cluster and we use that Kubernetes to help manage that. Which kind of uh, automation uh, do you support? For example, do you have a REST API? And uh, which kind of uh, integration uh, uh, do you have? Like, uh, do you have uh, Kubernetes uh, storage integration or uh, uh, integration with uh, backup software or, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, good question. There's a web services API. The web services API comes in, you know, through the same um, API set that we use for the for the UI. So it has similar capabilities and uses the same authentication methods. Um, the the we currently we do not have a, a CSI module for 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 Kubernetes. Um, that's something that we have on a roadmap. So we will be adding to the product. And uh, about uh backup you you are a file system so how, how do you think to protect uh, your file system in long term uh, for example with remote copy or 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 just integrating with uh, external uh, backup program that uh, in, in, a, in a more efficient way instead of just uh, grab uh, the file uh, as a normal uh, 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 client yeah that's a good question um, we, so from our, our experience, we have uh, our store next file system. We have a, we have a replication, um, uh, feature of that file system called FlexSync. And, uh, that, that feature is compatible with, with this product. So we have replication that can replicate between clusters. So if you have multiple clusters, you can replicate it, do a DR. Um, but we also can replicate between this system and our Stornex system, which gives more options. Um, Stornex has the capability to be connected to tape libraries, for example, where we can have uh, asynchronous replication between those two. Um, Quantum, uh, we, we have a strong partnership with the various different backup products. And we actually, Quantum also resells a Temple products. And uh, we, we have uh, solutions for using this with those products for just generalized backup purposes, backup and protect. Thank you. My understanding is that you're currently NFS only and other protocols are roadmap items. Um, that's, that's right. Yeah. I assume you'll be putting S3 on that fairly quickly since you pretty much have a key value store already and you just need to create an S3, um, client for it. Uh, but yep. what what sort of order are you going to be developing these? So you've got NFS. Is the next um, is the next priority going to be SMB file system, or is it going to be S three for object? Uh, next priority, we're most of the way through the development already is going to be SMB. Um, we feel that there's more more users using SMB than object storage um, or S three at the time. Um, there's still there still is a somewhat of a lack of general applications using S3 directly. Um, then, then, then it will be S3. We also have plans to have a, a proprietary file system client, like a parallel file system client, or sometimes called a POSIX file system client that could be installed directly on the uh, customer's client, which would give the benefit versus regular uh, NAS protocols of being a parallel access protocol. Are you looking at uh, developing PNFS as a corollary of that? Um, potentially. That that one's not, um, 
I don't think that we've decided completely whether or not we want to pursue PNFS. Fair enough. It is very complicated. I makes me sad that people don't implement it more, but it's hard to do. It's an interesting protocol. It has it has its use cases, but it's it's tough to stick it on top of something like this and have it do what it's supposed to do. Interesting is the polite way of describing PNFS. Yes. <laughs>